In the previous discussion with journalists from Central Europe, we discussed attacks on media done by oligarchs and governments. We talked about how they try to take control over media in the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary and Poland. Now we've invited a journalist from Belarus and two journalists from Ukraine. This may be a different story. Is it different? Or is the freedom of press in Ukraine and Belarus facing the same challenges as in Central Europe? Maybe I'll start by saying that Ukraine has always been ahead of the European countries and the phenomenon of oligarch media you can now see in the Czech Republic, Slovakia and Hungary probably has come from our region. I mean, it's our phenomenon. What is interesting and new is that Ukraine has dozens of TV channels, national channels which are very rich. It's not the time when you are creating an independent media and people watch it because national TV is boring and not interesting. Oligarchs own not simply TV channels, but groups of channels. Each politician, each of the richest Ukrainians have such. These are dozens of people. They appear. The pre-election period is about to start. Another rather rich channel has been launched recently. They invest a lot of money in digital technologies, the internet, not only TV. This is something new. That's why it generates the illusion of pluralism. But from the consumer point of view, are you always seeing a certain position supported by a certain media? It's important to understand that politicians ignore the media, which can ask them thorny questions. They do not need to talk to the journalists. They accept invitations only from the channels which belong to their media group, write columns for the digital platforms which they own. That's why there is no discussion. Certain groups have a monopoly on information. So this relates to private media, mainly televisions, right? They are sort of pioneers of oligarchy, or at least it was like that a few years ago. How about public service media? What is the current situation in Ukraine? The process of creating a national public broadcaster has just started. It's very interesting. I was listening to colleagues from the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, and found myself thinking that the situation in Ukraine is maybe even better. If we take Hungary and Poland, we can see there is a serious attack on public TV. Neo-authoritarian governments starting to influence it. Here, we have a reverse process. We are moving away from the authoritarian past. The times of Yanukovych, the painful process of forming national public broadcaster is ongoing. It's happening, not without problems, there are lots of them. Even post-Maidan government consider public TV to be, to a certain extent, a channel to promote their agenda. That's why the process is painful. There are some attempts to create financial obstacles, to cut the budget. Suddenly, it turns out that national public broadcaster is at risk of getting 50% less money than the law anticipated. But the process is ongoing. It seems to me that Sospilne tries to hold its position, although I do not guarantee that the situation that exists in Central and Eastern Europe will not repeat itself here. Both of you said things that are mostly related to television. Does it mean that print media are not relevant in Ukraine? They are important, but voters play a key role as they watch TV. We can say that Ukraine proves that an idea that the internet changes the information landscape does not work here. TV has got its revenge in the information field. For the majority of people, 
I do not remember exactly the figures, for about 70% or something like that. TV is the main source of information. Regarding the printed news media, the situation here is also very interesting. There are some influential printed media, but when it comes to daily newspapers, we have a crisis. Weeklies are more influential. It's important to mention that dailies haven't succeeded. We do not have any quality daily newspapers one can buy. We have never had such. That's why we switched to online news back in the 2000s. It happened that we skipped some stages. On the other hand, our tragedy is that we do not have quality media. They are suffering a crisis because of tabloid media. I mean, serious media like The Guardian and the rest. In Ukraine, we are working on creating media which will give access at least to a part of society. Media or TV which will provide good quality and verified information. I mean, not a separate investigative project, not a separate brave journalistic project, but an opportunity to understand what is really happening on a daily basis. We are currently trying to launch such things. And Ukraine is very lucky because right after Maidan and before it, there was a process. We understood there was a need to come up with something. I know that Polish colleagues now often ask us about the case of Romatska. It's an NGO which works as independent TV. The point is that we had to launch such things much earlier. I mean things that will confront the crisis in Central Europe. If I understand the situation in Ukraine correctly, the print media are only in their infancy, at least when it comes to high-quality print, and televisions are often owned by politicians, oligarchs, and there are several independent TV stations. Is this the current media landscape in Ukraine? If we're talking about TV, then yes, it is mainly controlled by oligarchs. If we're talking about printed news media, it's not true that it is only starting to appear. We had it. It has existed during the times of independence. Natalka is right. We can't name a daily newspaper which has existed for 50 years because all post-Soviet newspapers either turned into yellow journalism or into instruments of Russian propaganda, or simply disappeared. In the 2000s, we had a situation where each two to three years, a new printed news medium was being launched, either a weekly or a daily newspaper. So, we have such, but, of course, people mainly choose the internet or TV. If we're talking about TV, not necessarily everything is bad on oligarchic TV channels. Not everything is bad there. We have several political talk shows, at least one which is balanced and good. But, of course, we can see the imbalance in the news. How to combat it? There are two ways. Either to create your own platform to promote your point of view, and the majority of Ukrainian politicians and businessmen prefer this way, or to create a media based on fact-checking and journalistic standards. The second way seems to be obvious, but it turns out that in the global information landscape where everyone chooses the first way and prefers to have their own platform to promote their opinion, this second way is not that popular, even within the society in general. When we started to organize this program a year ago, we met several journalists from Ukraine and we saw two nice attempts. It is your TV, which is neither private nor oligarchic or public service. 
And then there is this attempt of the Ukrainian public service television to reform itself and do some independent journalism. What is the situation with these two TV stations nowadays? These days, we are celebrating Hromadatske's fifth anniversary. Recently, the national budget of Ukraine has been adopted. Suspilne received only 57% of its planned budget. For me, it is easier to talk about us, although we are following. We have chosen the way of quality and non-populistic media after the revolution, after the war. It's obvious that it was a hard way because people want to hear certain ideas. People want someone to tell them what is right and popularize the heroes, which, however, are heroes only for certain groups. We have chosen a different way, and after five years, I can say that it was the right decision. It is a long story, but the main thing is that we created such an institution. It's important to keep it stable. The key issue is money. We are dependent on foreign donors on dozens of them, but we are not editorially dependent on any of them. They do not influence the editorial policy. However, after some experiments with financial models, we came to the understanding that there is no other way. You can sell something, advertising and so on, but you can't be financially independent in the short term, however big our desire is. The second point you are significantly dependent on the market. If there is no advertising market, if there is a corporate conspiracy on the market of advertising, cable TV operators, etc., there is a huge world of corruption which creates obstacles. But I do believe that in 2018 National Public Broadcaster has had a new role. Neither you nor the whole country will turn on TV to watch a discussion. You have to search for asymmetric ways how to communicate with people in a fragmented and polarized society. You understand that you have to be very attractive in what you do, to invest a lot of money in promotion of your company. To sum up, I'd like to say that we have succeeded. I have recently talked to my colleagues, congratulated them on the fifth anniversary. Because whatever happens, I respect the world's independent media, the BBC and Radio Free Europe, but their budgets are also paid by someone. If one wants, there will be a budget for Ukraine. If no, it won't be. An owner may close the news company if he wants. In our case, it's a stable organization in which people can do something which has access to the satellite cable TV. Our task is to fight for audience, to become important for the audience, the audience which doesn't want to hear something it doesn't like. It is a challenge for us. In a few words regarding Suspilne, I support the reform. A lot of our colleagues joined the team of Suspilne, but they are currently focused on the administrative reform of the organizational structure. They are doing a good job, but face the same challenge. They probably don't have an audience. They have to find a way of reaching it. I'll be honest, we are not big players on the market, but we are definitely players on the market. Our stories can't be ignored. Maybe that means something. And it's not a separate investigation, as I have mentioned, but daily news, so Ukrainians have a source of qualitative and balanced information. Your TV station was founded by journalists and it is paid by donors. Ukraine's public service TV is an interesting case, as it is in a difficult situation during the war. Even in Western democracies, there can be wartime censorship and freedom of speech may be restricted. 
So what does the Ukrainian public TV do about this situation? How does it deal with the fact that politicians may want to use it as a channel for its approach? It is a very difficult question. The current management of Suspilne is supporting the idea that they are independent from any censorship and influence. But you have to understand Ukrainian information landscape. We often speak about traumas. It is also very traumatized. It's traumatized by Russian propaganda, the Russian information war, the aim of which is to make people doubt, doubt independence, you're a Maidan, and so on. In this sense, some Ukrainian politicians understand that they live in an information environment which is full of discourse, of betrayal, as Ukrainians say. Everyone discusses what a bad government we have and criticize. They start to perceive Suspilne as counterbalance to this negative information flow which exists. And there is a dilemma. Because if you agree with the idea that Suspilne should confront critics, you support propaganda, either soft or not so soft. On the other hand, if you support the idea to be critical, you start thinking whether you play into the hands of the enemy. As for me, freedom should be first. And then journalists have to make decisions where criticism is justified and where it is not. When journalists have to inform about negative things and when they should mention success stories, there are a lot of success stories in Ukraine and not so many media which cover this issue. The battle continues, taking into account the budget adopted. The government doesn't accept the idea that media financed from the budget can be truly independent. Talking about this in Central Europe, we see the freedom of speech from the perspective of free countries. Ukraine is a country which had to stand up and fight for its freedom. If we talk about freedom of speech in Belarus, is it possible at all to talk about free media and free speech in this country? I am following with envy what Ukrainians are doing and envy their problems. I'm happy there are pioneers like Ukrainian media which overcome all the obstacles and we have opportunity to learn from their mistakes, to not repeat them when changes happen in Belarus. Foreign journalists often call Belarus communist with a taste of cappuccino. However, cappuccino goes to tourists who arrive and see clean streets as in the Third Reich and communism goes to journalists and activists who sit in prisons and had to pay 200 fines in 2018 alone. Of course, there is no freedom, neither in media nor in the civil sector. It is a battle for survival, but on the other hand it stimulates media. Small newsrooms, such as Radio Free Europe, do not stand still to experiment. I don't think that printed media have any future. Sooner or later it will die and our nostalgia for a paper book will remain in the history. Also, I do not think that cable TV will play a significant role in the future of Belarus. We can skip a certain stage as you skipped it in Ukraine, to skip the stage of traditional media and switch directly to the new media. What is happening in Belarus is constant experiment. We experiment with virtual reality, 
New platform. Belarusian journalists are starting to learn how to use forbidden platforms such as TikTok as they don't have access to state TV and they have to experiment even with Tinder. Belarusian media make attempts to launch bots, nets, automatized systems for content distribution because the traditional methods are not available to us. What I like is that young journalists who study at propagandistic faculties of journalism in Belarus are also becoming advocates of media experiments. That's why I think there is no freedom of speech now, but when the discussion about it is launched in Belarus, it will appear very quickly, step by step, and we won't have such a long transition period as Ukraine. For freedom of speech in Belarus, could internet and online platforms be helpful? Is internet free in Belarus? The internet in Belarus is fast, but not free. But the fact we have it, and the fact that more than 72% of people have access to it, gives us great opportunities. The task is to explain to people how to get access to the blocked websites, how to circumvent censorship. It depends much on journalists. We do not only spread content, we form the culture of content consumption. We deal with media education. In fact, a lot of publications of Radio Free Europe are devoted to the ways of providing access to independent websites for elderly people, because there is a long list of independent media which are blocked in Belarus. For instance, the news website Charter 97. Nobody knows when the next one will be blocked. You never know when the, a KGB agent or special forces come and destroy your office and that is the end. That's why a lot of editorial offices switched to the virtual world, communicate via secured messengers and show good results. If before we used to compete with Lukashenko's propaganda, which was dominating and kept everything under control, as there was no privatization in Belarus, all the media were under control of the government. Now we are witnessing active measures taken by Putin, his Sputnik, and all that small media support by Yandex News and Mail.ru News. Sputnik appeared in Belarus one year ago as a niche marginal media. Its audience reach was 100,000 people per month. Now it is ahead of five key news websites put together. Why did it happen so? Thanks to the infrastructure of the Russian Kremlin media network, first of all, Yandex. When we are talking about media, we have to understand that it's not only brand, but also social media infrastructure, news aggregators which support these media. We have no idea how to compete with Sputnik and with those pro-Russian regional local publics. If I understand this correctly, the internet is controlled. Is it something like in China, where critical websites are off or banned, and official media are under control of Lukashenko or Russia? From this point of view, it seems desperate. I wouldn't say so. I have this hope. I see this hope in experimentation, creativity of Belarusians. They say that Belarus is an IT country, and it's true. A lot of companies here do work outsourced from America. The power is in IT specialists who can solve unsolvable issues and journalists. Belarus is the case where technologies can help usher in democracy. We do have traditional media, printed newspapers, which are actively distributed to every school by Lukashenko with his portrait on the front page. Also, we have Russian media, which are an innovative, to a certain extent, which have an apparat of support. And we do have small, low-budget projects, as was Romatske at the very beginning, which are not guaranteed to survive, but which have the enthusiasm to survive. 
We are learning from Hromadske, from small Ukrainian projects, learn how to make podcasts from Slovak SMR, from the Chik Idnes, learning from Gazeta and their small radio projects. It is a moment when we are actively experimenting and learn from the mistakes of others. So, if you learn and do these experiments, is it illegal or is it just that the government can't see it? Yes, the government will arrive and forbid it. In Belarus it does not work like this, that you register the medium and all the doors are open for you. Kiki.org, a little youth site, was blocked. After the scandal and reaction of the West, it was unblocked. So the blocking of sites and censorship applies not only to big political media such as Radio Free Europe or Belsat, but also to all sites which influence small target groups of people. Radio Free Europe doesn't have an official office in Minsk, and even the journalists who have accreditation are often imprisoned. They often receive fines and are accused of working for American media. Lukashenko is kind of balancing between the West and the East. He knows that it is better not to touch Radio Free Europe because it is American, and in such case Americans won't give money. But he is taking out on the polls those who finance Radio Raitia, Belsat, European Radio for Belarus, those who do not contribute to his political well-being. If there is a danger for young Belarusians who start an internet portal or television that publicizes critical content and gets prohibited, is it dangerous? KGB agents came to my colleagues from Radio Free Europe two to three days ago, and such things are happening regularly. They come, copy files, ask protocol questions, and let people free. What matters now is not to create a brand, but to create infrastructure for distribution. For Belarus, such platform as Telegram proved to be useful. It gives opportunity to have small, well-targeted projects. It's a messenger like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. We created channels, economy of Belarus, nature of Belarus, politics of Belarus. People do not have to follow all the news of Radio Free Europe. They subscribe to certain topics. I think that future in journalism is in hyper-local projects. When people subscribe to certain topics they are interested in and we can supply this good quality information to them in a reliable way. In Slovakia, a journalist was murdered this year. He was an investigative journalist and he was exploring mistakes done by contemporary politicians. Ukraine is in war. How safe or how dangerous is it to be a journalist in today's Ukraine? In order for our Slovak audience to understand, I have to mention that we, Hormatske, prepare a lot of materials about Kurkikov. It's really a tragedy for our profession. Journalists are under threat. We are in a difficult situation, as it is not easy for us to talk about danger and killings of journalists because of Russian propaganda, which uses everything that happens in Ukraine for its own purposes. But, as an editor, as a journalist who worked at Maidan, in the conflict zone, who covers the conflict in Ukraine, I can say honestly that yes, it's dangerous. I worry about my journalists. This week, our colleague Nastia Stanko, Romatske TV journalist, has received International Press Freedom Award in New York. It's one of the most prestigious world awards. She covers the issue of war from the humanitarian point of view. One of her stories has to do with, she mainly covers human tragedy, secret department of the security service of Ukraine, topic which is unpopular during the wartime. Of course, there is no direct link, but there were moments when we were told that we knew that journalists didn't feel safe. Of course, the killing of Pavlo Shermet, Belarusian journalist, isn't solved, unless it is investigated. I won't say that it is safe. 
We don't know who did it. We know that the president said that it was a matter of his honor to investigate the killing. He was our close colleague. Our team prepared an investigation. We have access to top officials. However, during these two years, we haven't been informed how the investigation has been going. We haven't received even a hint. That's why I can't speak about safety. What I'm always explaining is that there is a new dimension of safety caused by the war and which is probably not connected so much with Ukrainian government, but with Russian aggression which sparked a war in Ukraine. Anyway, tolerance towards use of weapons has changed in society. If before we were shocked, you didn't imagine that it could happen. Now we understand that it is possible. That's why I can say we don't feel safe and have to be honest regarding this, not to think how it will be perceived. The situation is really like that, and the answer could be penalty for crimes, and at least a hint that the investigation is ongoing. In the case of Daphna, a journalist from Malta who was killed, the Maltese government found who ordered it. We are following it. There is at least minimal progress. In our case, no. So what can we talk about? The danger for journalists in a war zone is one thing. And another thing is the danger for journalists writing about Poroshenko, Klitschko, or political parties that are in power, that are against Russia and for free Ukraine, yet still have their oligarchs and interests. In Slovakia, there was the murder I mentioned, but also some journalists are being followed, discredited or ridiculed. What do you think when you write about things that are happening here? Everything I mentioned before has to do with domestic policy. I should say that Russia uses other instruments to influence Ukrainian information landscape, to say that Ukraine is a failed state, all the Russian propaganda abroad. But when it comes to Ukrainian journalists, they write mainly about Ukraine. That's why in my prior speech I meant not a risk of being killed during the conflict. It exists. We know the case of Stanislav Asayev, journalist who is now in captivity in Donetsk, Radio Free Europe blogger. He has been in detention for a long time already. We know what it means to work there, in those territories. Mykola Semana is a journalist from Crimea, a case against whom was open. It's an obvious danger. The story about Pavlo Sheremet happened here in Kiev two kilometers away from the studio, on a typical peaceful day. This is scary, but I understand that it is a global trend, but it shouldn't be used as an excuse by the Ukrainian law enforcement agencies that journalists are killed worldwide. But I want to mention that Ukraine has some very good investigative journalism projects, which are very popular. It's true that these are cases of smear campaigns against investigative journalists. It creates an atmosphere of danger around such journalists. When I mentioned our colleague and her internal investigation, I am convinced that it is our business, unfortunately it is our war, our corruption, our task to prepare such painful stories. Foreign journalists from the New York Times won't come to Ukraine to conduct serious investigation. They won't do it. The investigation of the Pavlo Sheremet's killing was prepared by our journalists. All the most important investigations are prepared by Ukrainian journalists. How free do you feel when you write about current power and the mistakes they make? It is more free than at the times of Yanukovych, there is no doubt. Look, on the one hand, I support what Natalia says, but on the other hand, you shouldn't think that there is an authoritarian government which controls everything. These oligarchic channels we are talking about can also be critical of Poroshenko and many others. 
The danger may be coming not from the top figure, but from the unreformed prosecution, from local prosecutors, local police. The killing of the activist Katarina Hansjuk is one of the most tragic events of the last months. It means that the system which Maiden was called to reform is either reformed only partially or it is not reformed at all. And the main reform to make is the reform of law enforcement. So, I am ambivalent about this issue. Ukraine is much more free than in 2013 or 2012, also from the point of view of journalism. Ukrainian journalists can conduct investigations about Poroshenko, which can be scandalous, may harm Poroshenko's rating, but they will continue their work. But it doesn't mean that they can feel safe. That's it. You worked for Radio Liberty. I worked for Radio Free Europe in the early 1990s, so we are colleagues in a way. For some time, it felt a little strange, because you write or say something you find true, but society is not changing. On the contrary, the wrong tendencies are getting stronger. Sometimes we were told reproachfully that it is easy to talk about such things on a radio sponsored by the US Congress. Do you feel that working for Radio Liberty and speaking about Belarus makes sense? I think a lot has changed since the 1990s. A lot has changed since the 1950s when Radio Free Europe was launched. Attitude to the West has changed, especially among the Belarusian youth. The youth loves the US, the West. There is no such an attitude that they are financed by the US so they are propagandists. This is used by Lukashenko's propaganda and Russia to discredit us. After the publication of articles, investigations, fact-checking materials, they say, of course they found it because Trump, Obama, Bush ordered them to do it. I think it harms, but also helps, because the reputation Radio Free Europe has, and which hasn't been stained during seven years of existence, makes people believe that this organization is stable. We don't seek to be first as news aggregators, tabloids. We take another 10, 15, 20 minutes to check facts to the extent it is possible in Belarus. We are probably the only medium which checks information from two independent sources before publishing it in social media. An interesting fact is that for a lot of young people, Radio Free Europe is first of all a Facebook, VK and Twitter page. They do not remember Radio Free Europe as radio because they haven't seen videos or articles, but they have seen our posts. Many young people in Belarus associate posts or live streams with Radio Free Europe. They have no idea that Radio Free Europe was established at the times of Cold War. Maybe it is even for the better. It also happens that American Radio Free Europe is a shield for our journalists and contributors and for our sources. When they are thinking whom to give information, they usually give it to us. There has been a scandal recently. Activists of modern Belarusian Komsomol, called BRSM, made people join this organization by threatening them with being expelled from school and fired from work if they wouldn't join. They recorded a video of how a teacher talks to them and sent it to our Facebook page. This video has had 1.5 million views and has become the most popular in our history. 
in the history of Belarusian Radio Free Europe. Radio Free Europe, in our case, became a digital trendsetter which works with user-generated content sent by people. And if you take a look what we do now and what you did in the 1990s, these are two different things. Thank God. The last question. I've had several friends who were journalists and stopped doing this work recently because they felt their jobs did not make sense. They felt that they could discover something and write about it. But in the end, politicians and oligarchs find their ways and come to agreement. In Ukraine, it might be the feeling that the USA and Russia will come to agreement. So, who is this work important for? Or is it just a way of earning money? And therefore, many of my friends felt disillusioned. They did not see the point of doing journalistic work. The three of you work as journalists in very tough conditions. In Ukraine, that is, at war, and in Belarus with limited freedom of speech. What would you tell my friends who gave up journalism because they felt it did not make sense? My identity, my story is different. I am not a journalist by profession, I am a philosopher and author first of all. Maidan made me join journalism. I am not sure that I will stay in journalism for long. It's a different story. The point is that the shortage of reliable and clear information was so significant in Ukraine that people from other spheres switched to journalism to share their knowledge and information. Regarding the things you're talking about, we also saw such a situation, I'd say after the Orange Revolution in the mid-2000s. There was a very powerful article or interview by Yulia Mostova, an editor of one of the biggest weekly newspapers in Ukraine, in which she said, yes, we have freedom of speech in Ukraine, but it doesn't influence anything. It doesn't influence politicians and the way they conduct themselves. Actually, the situation is well known. It is also an illusion that democracy means just free elections and media. It is an illusion we lived in after the 1990s. And the Western countries also understand it now. Democracy is not only about free elections and media, but a couple of more things. For instance, stable and independent institutions, law enforcement agencies, anti-corruption institutions. These things are important. If these things are not present in society, then journalism doesn't matter. But if there is no free journalism, there will be no free institutions. I'd say that journalism should be considered in a long-term perspective. One shouldn't think that a column, article or investigation can change something. But if there is none of it, then there will definitely be no changes. Let me explain things on different stages. First, we have a lot of colleagues among Ukrainian journalists who become politicians, partly because they thought that their influence there would be greater. Now we see that one can have influence in both spheres. We are a small organization which is competing with something big. We understand that we have none of that clickbait, those billions, the money to create infrastructure, but for journalists, it is important to have this feeling that they are influencing something. Our team, my team, needs to understand that what they do matters. It's very difficult. You are preparing an investigation, but nothing is happening. It's the same all around the world. I saw American journalists saying that they had told everything about Trump, but there were no consequences. We have managed to find ways to measure our impact on micro, meso, 
and macro level each quarter, literally. This concrete story influenced the life of this person. Thanks to this, such a thing happened and so on. Oleg Sentsov, a famous Ukrainian director, has been in prison in Russia for two years already. The whole world knows him. We were the only media present at the first court hearing against Sentsov in Rostov. For the whole year we were the only media telling about Sentsov. Then everyone spoke about another prisoner, Nadia Savchenko. One year, two years, three years, and then this story was picked up by other media. Then you understand that it works. That's why we started to measure our impact. Sometimes you initiate the discussion and maybe in a year there will be some actions, some cases will be opened. This is not enough. You don't change the country, but anyway. And the last, first of all, I sincerely believe that our politicians lack information to make decisions. They do not fully understand what is going on in Crimea. My going there may help them to form their opinion on whether to cut off the water or not. Maybe this information will be somewhere and my conscience will be clean as I have provided it. Of course, you have to work to be heard. And the last thing, today people talk a lot about media literacy. It's the most popular topic in the world. Fact-checking, people reading unchecked information on social media, sharing it. It turned out that journalists are now professionals in this sphere, which is in high demand, the sphere of fact-checking. It is a skill we were taught. You arrive to the venue, talk to one person and ask him to show a passport. If he tells you that his house was destroyed, you ask him to show it. Isn't it imaginary? If something has happened to someone, you ask that person to show. We were taught how to identify reality and how to distinguish and formulate that possible reality and truth in this postmodern world where they say there are no facts, no reality. That's why I think that people who are professionally taught how to check facts are in high demand. There is a need for them now as never before. Frarak, why are you a journalist? I have a different story. I started as an activist. I started my journalism career due to arrests. First short term, then long term. Then I was in the isolation in the army for one and a half years, where I became a journalist as I wrote every single day in my diary. That's why journalism for me, for a lot of my peers and colleagues, became a powerful weapon and opportunity to change something in our country. I like the tactics of small victories. We have to show that we can win, that evil is not forever, that we are moving ahead, because for many people everything looks hopeless. They are frustrated with corrupt politicians, in endless dictatorships of Lukashenko, in populists Orban and others. What we can give is show that we can change the world even with nothing, no resources, no political and business lobby. This opportunity to change things, to help people, in my case, to change Belarus for the better, gives me adrenaline, makes my heart beat. My parents taught me that everything can be achieved by small steps, small things, and it is important to start with yourself. And journalists, small initiatives launched will make changes in Belarus and the whole region which will become free and journalism which suffers a crisis right now will prosper as a profession and probably will gain a new reputation. Because we are not journalists anymore, we are communication specialists. We build this communication, small threads in the grid, and give people opportunity to understand who they are and what their responsibility for the region they live in is. 
This was the episode on the power of freedom of speech. Franak, Natalia, Volodymyr, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.